and it's nice to see all the faces here. This is a great turnout for tonight. Um, this talk is about um, indexes and relational databases, and it sort of came up from a discussion that we had in the Halahex Slack channel a few months ago. Um, we'd been going through a few interviews and, and asking people about uh, databases and starting to get into a little bit of depth about indexes, and we found that a lot of people didn't really know much about how relational indexes work beyond just doing a create index call. So the purpose of this is just to dive in a little bit about indexes and what they are and how to sort of make them better. Um, and database tuning is a fine art and, it's, uh, and it depends completely on which database you're using. Every database has a different way of making a square circle. Uh, and none of this is gonna make a row of beans difference if you uh, don't have a lot of data. So this is really, the sort of boundary cases when you're pushing your database to the limits and, uh, and, and finding out where things break. Most of th this talk is mostly slanted towards Postgres, but I mean, the, I think the principles basically apply uh, all over. Basically what it comes down to is, is persistent storage. You've got some data that when the power goes off, you wanna be able to keep it. Um, with old hard drives, it was literally a spinning platter with heads that moved across them and, and there was you know, actual time delays and physical access there. Solid state drives make it a little bit better. I mean, actually they make it a lot better, but um, you still have the same, same problem um, that you're, you have to move bits around. So the strategy ultimately for using any relational database is to uh, minimize disk access. The, the less you have to go out to a slow medium, the better. So um, it's physics, right? How do you move the bits around? So the more you can keep in RAM, the better. RAM is just a lot faster than disk. Um, obviously you can't store your whole database in RAM. So you had to store some smaller portion of it in so that you can get to the disk and only read the stuff from the disk that you actually need. Um, so whether it's MySQL or Postgres or SQL Server or whatever, they're all basically relational databases. Um, you know, even like Elasticsearch and stuff, I mean, they base the principles are largely the same. There are some MapReduce uh, principles with some of them. But um, if, you, if you're really into big data, then you have to start looking at other strategies other than relational databases. So columnar databases or distributed uh, MapReduce type databases. And there's a bunch of really cool ones out there. I'm not going to talk about those, though. So. Time series databases are another neat one. If you've got something that's, that's sort of time indexed, there are databases you can get that just do a great job with it. Um, so imagine you're running your database on a Raspberry Pi, right? A very slow machine, uh, very excessively slow trying to read and write from that flash drive. Um, and if you can keep it in memory, all the better. You don't have a whole lot of options with relational databases in terms of scaling them up. You basically, you can just throw more memory at it. Uh, there are tricks you can do with read replicas and things like that, but ultimately to a database, you just have to start getting into vertical scaling. Uh, and if you look at the difference in, in throughputs of like RAM at about 16 gigabits per, or, or gigabits per second, and then a SATA protocol, which is you know about six, or and then a solid state drive, which is about 500 megabits per second. Uh, you can see that the the more you can keep in memory, the better. So when you're sizing out your database server, throw as much memory at it as you can afford. Uh, the disk itself is actually pretty cheap. So what is a, a, an index? First of all, it's it's just a data structure, and it's typically modeled as a B tree. And if you did your computer science, you know what a B tree is. It's just a like a, a tree structure that uh, has very efficient inserts. So you don't have to rebalance the whole tree after every time you add something new to it, you can grow a node uh, relatively inexpensively. So you have an index per column in your database. So if you have name, address, phone number, you have an index for each of those. And if you don't have an index, basically the, the rows of your database go in in the order that they were inserted. So they're just all over the place. Uh, they don't usually get moved around. Once they get written, they're pretty well written for good. Um, so if you don't have an index, you're basically doing a table scan. So if you've got a million rows in your database, you're starting at record one and you're going all the way to record one million to try and find what you need. So obviously that's a lot of disk access and that's the thing we want to avoid. 
Uh, one thing that you'll hear a lot is when the database is slow, uh, people say, well, just you're missing an index, just throw an index at it. Uh, but there's a lot of catches with that. Um, you can't keep your index in memory, right? Uh, typically, especially when you start to hit scale. Um, so what the databases will do is they'll move data in and out. Um, they'll move data in and out of, uh, out of memory and move it to disk and they'll page in just like your operating system does. They'll page in data a little bit at a time, but that's re that's a resource contention problem. Then now you've got your index fighting with your regular data on your disk. So you can only get into there so often. Now you can partition your index and put it on a different drive and things, which is not a bad idea, but basically you want to try and minimize that anyway. So the next section is basically some, uh, some, uh, well, Look at the look at the picture. What does that mean? Sage advice. So here's some <laughs> sage advice for uh, how to use your indexes effectively. And and like I say, I mean this this is for most cases, but um, uh, you know every database is different, and you know you're gonna want to mess with it. So the number one thing is try not to make your primary index on a fat field and a fat field is like text or JSON or UUIDs or uh, variable characters. Um, th these things are just big and they just take up a lot of memory. Now, sometimes you can't avoid it. I know a lot of people like to create columns that are UUIDs and they go, Oh yeah, but I know it's unique. And, and if you can change that to a, an integer or something, you'll save yourself a lot of headaches. Uh, there, there is pros and cons to doing that though. Just, use less bytes, right? Uh, normalize your database. If you're not familiar with normal uh, database normalization, just do a Google on it. There's just look for normal forms. There's, you know, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, normal form. Uh, but basically it, it sort of gives you ways that you can share your indexes across multiple tables uh, if you denormalize your data. There's a bit of a, a, a religious argument about this stuff. It's like some people say, well, disk is cheap, so fully denormalize your data, and then you can just pull in more rows. Uh, that's a great discussion to have over beers afterwards. Um, but uh, in, in general, normalizing your database is, is a, a great strategy. Partial indexes. This is one that I don't know why more people don't do it. Um, your create index call can take a where clause. So don't index the data that you don't need. Um, so if you've got, uh, like in this case here, this is a job index, and the, the index is only going to index where the state of the job is running. Because who cares if the job has failed or if it's done or whatever. Maybe you've got some other index for that, like a job ID or something. But if you want to find running jobs, just index those. If, you're, if your index only has a couple of fields in it, then you're basically doing a table scan, but just on a smaller section of it. Um, you can create indexes across multiple columns. And if you look at the bottom there, it says create index foo on table, column this, column that. Um, because you can do it, doesn't make it a good idea. You can drive a car with your feet, doesn't make it a good idea. Um, so if you can, prefer single, multiple single column indexes over uh, multi-column indexes. So for example, if you look on the right over there, if I, in this case, I've got a multi-column index on this and that, if I do a select and I supply right, nice and fast, if I so do a, um, a query on the first part of the index, the this part, great. But if I only do an index on the second part, not so great. Then it has to basically do a table scan on that part of the index until it can find the second part. Um, multiple column indexes are really good for time series databases uh, or for time series related tables, but uh, other than that, try and avoid them. Look for high cardinality on your uh, index columns. So things that have big variation in them. Booleans are terrible. Uh, enums that only have like six or seven different values or you know a, a couple of dozen values, probably not that great. Um, but things that have uh, high variance because then the B tree can balance out a lot better and it, can, it doesn't have to reshuffle all that much. Now, I, I know earlier I said don't use UUIDs. Um, if you have to use them, you know, at least they have high variation on them. Uh, so floats are actually pretty good too, because it depends on your range of your floats, but, uh, and then this is just some common sense stuff. Um, put telemetry on all your queries. Uh, so you can see, you know, put 
most databases have a slow query log. Enable that, get alerts on it, find out when you've hit some new level in your, in your access. This is a Postgres sort of thing, but uh, Postgres does clean up of the database. Like it basically just writes everything in and then after a while, it's like garbage collection, it goes in and sort of cleans up. Um, so turn on auto vacuum and, and make that happen all the time. There's a reason for that. Um, and that even, even if you're updating parts of your database that don't have, uh, that aren't indexed, you still need the vacuum. Um, but the query planner uses the index statistics to come up with a better plan. So if you're not vacuuming and if you're not keeping your index fresh, then your queries will suffer because the database can't use all those little wonderful hints that it gleaned. Um, so you got to give it some time to, to get its uh, head together. Um, just like in, in, in the last talk, I would want to know more about the explain stuff. Explain is sort of the keys to the kingdom with this stuff. You want to find out how is your database thinking about how that query is going to look? So I might start with a, a simple little uh, query like on the left, but when I look at it, I can see, oh, okay, this is going to do a bitmap lookup. This is going to do a, an index scan on a reduced set. And if, if you get really good at reading these query plans, uh, you can really know how to tune your, uh, your queries and your operations. If you see that it's scanning a million rows, you probably got a problem. Uh, so databases don't degrade gracefully. They uh, go pear-shaped very quickly. You're not going to see a nice little curve of things getting slower. They're just going to go and then die horribly. And hopefully it doesn't happen on a Friday night at 10 o'clock. So uh, try to have a little bit more strategy than just throwing stuff at the wall and see what sticks. <laughs> there we go. How do we do on time on that? Great. So does anybody have any questions for Sandy? Everyone just knows everything about database indexes right now. So, I, see so a I have a question. Um, I've raised my hand, but no one says, so I just jump in. Um, um, you mentioned that we shouldn't have like indexes on multiple columns. Um, why? Is that like I, I know indexes are like they depend mostly on like queries you make like you know on the business logic for example in my case like I believe like indexes on uh, multiple columns are super useful especially like if you are querying in order of something so you have like some sort of key and then you order by time so like if you make the index on like you know two columns then then like determining data in order it basically is for free like and maintaining those indexes takes space and CPUs. But I think like if you have millions of rows, but you just need like, um, you know, the rows between January 5th and 7th, um, then this index of multiple columns like super useful. Yeah, yeah, it can be. Uh, and the time example that you gave is a great one. Uh, but generally the database can do just as well with two individual indexes. Um, it'll just look up one, it'll make a reduced set and then it'll use that uh, to filter on the second one. So, uh, but again, it depends on the database. Um, uh, and if you, if you do have a very uh, highly active query in your business case, that'll benefit from it, then absolutely use a, a, you know, a multi-column index. But uh, in, in the majority of cases, you'll get pretty close to the same performance by having two single indexes. And I also have like the question back to um, the comment maybe about normalization, the normalization. I used to be like believer in everything has to be normalized, but then sometimes you need to do trade-offs on efficiency because you cannot join like five different tables. Um, sometimes you need to denormalize data and keep it um, coupled yeah. with some other data. It's just yeah, no, absolutely, I, and I'm I'm of the same boat too. I, I like it's just so, so so much simpler to have everything in one table and you know just grab what you need and and like i say disk is cheap right so if you can still do the indexes and if you don't mind getting back a lot of duplicate data it really depends on on what sort of stuff you're storing in there i mean if you're just storing addresses or something you know where every row is unique but if you've got uh, a lot of duplication in the rows um then maybe do normalization is that you know you're it's going to cost you a little bit more on the disk side. But again, uh, those queries are so much simpler. So that's why I say it's sort of like a, 
it's a bit of a religious debate over beer, but yeah. And the last question, what's your stand on like database triggers? I know like they used to be very popular. People believed in them, especially like keeping the data like, you know, consistent. However, I believe like nowadays, like some developers, they don't, or they don't even know about that such a thing exists or like they're very against that, or um, let's say they want to keep all the logic in the code. Yeah, that's another one. I'd, I'd be curious to get uh, Bagby's uh, opinion on this as well. I mean, personally, I don't, it's like stored procedures. That was another thing that, you know, people started yeah. moving more stuff up into the database and stuff. But I, I, you know, I think the database is just try and focus on one thing and do one thing well. Um, triggers are, are a tricky one. I mean, I think, um, you know, especially if you're using a cloud native architecture, there's other ways to tackle that with pub sub and, and more event driven stuff. Um, so I guess it depends that way. Uh, it, it also depends on how many readers and writers you have coming from uh, going into or out of your database. If, if you've just got one service talking to one database, you probably you can control that in the service and you probably don't need to let the database do it. But if you've got a whole bunch of disparate services hitting your database directly, you probably got no choice. You probably have to use something like triggers and then maybe have that trigger a pub sub or something. So it's it's a it's a tricky one. Uh, I, but my personal preference is I prefer to use a more cloud native uh, architecture and just do it through uh, you know some sort of queuing mechanism or something in the service. Thank you. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, again, I have not been a fan of triggers, but uh, some cases I, I feel, I mean, again, with most things in application development, it depends on your particular use case. So if most of your data is just sitting in the database and you're just updating that one particular, like for example, you're sitting an updated ad column. I think instead of doing it at the application level, it makes sense to do it at the database level. But then if you have like a three long tree based update where it's touching a whole bunch of things, probably you should you know, have like a pub sub system. And yeah, I, I agree with that. Yeah, it, it, it's a tricky one, but. Yeah, it's like, especially triggers are super useful if you denormalize data and then like to keep this denormalized data in other tables once you update the data in some other table. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we could go down a whole other, um, you know, road of talking about, do you want, do you put a lot of constraints on your database and like cascading deletes and all the rest of that stuff for your, referential integrity or, or do you, you know, try and do that in the application to make it easier to do migrations. It's, it's, it's very similar type problems. You know, do you do it in triggers or do you do it, you know, separately? Great. And I think Devin had a question maybe next. My, uh, my, my question was uh, about the multiple indexes as well. Um, do you work with GIS or um, geospatial data? Um, and if so, if you found um, multiple indexes useful, uh, in, in particular, do databases support uh, these spatial queries in efficient ways, or is that better implemented um, in the application layer? Uh, yeah, that's a timely one. That's sort of what we do is all geospatial stuff. Uh, what we find, I mean, Postgres is great for that. There, there's a post GIS, which gives you all the GIS extensions for, for all those sort of operations, um, you know, polygon intersections and, uh, you know, point inclusions and all, all that sort of stuff. Um, and it's, it's really, it's, it's really quite good. Um, but uh, what we found is for like our, for our index, it's, it, I mean, this is a bit of an exception because we've got a lot of data, but uh, we, we have an Elasticsearch cluster that we run over top of for our GIS operations. And then they go back and reference stuff that might be stored in Bigtable or some other larger database. Uh, but yeah, if you're doing uh, small geospatial stuff, uh, Postgres and, and Post GIS extensions are, are great. Yeah. Thanks, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. All right, is there anyone else that has a question before we take a short break? We're a little bit ahead of schedule. So if anybody has, Patrick, do you have a question? Oh. I've got a quick question if uh, nobody else does. Uh, Sandy, you mentioned that you're working with Elasticsearch and Postgres. Um, we have a, a Lucene database or whatever it is that we're looking to better integrate with our Postgres data. 
Have you had any luck with doing that in any layer but the application layer? This things like uh, ZomboDB that act as a foreign data wrapper. Uh, I've played with full text search in Postgres. I haven't quite found the right fit. Um, have you had any experience integrating them well? No, we try and keep to vanilla elastic and, uh, and then just store uh, some indexes afterwards and then go up to big table and, and grab stuff from there. But uh, I mean, it's, it's hard enough that we found anyway, it's hard enough just trying to maintain an elastic uh, cluster at, at scale uh, without having to worry about, you know, more extensions and add-ons to it. It depends on your application, yeah. And one more thing is like, just remember, I, I believe from my experience, it's like you always need to choose the right, uh, right tool for the right job. Uh, because like, yes, you can do in database, like query like and something, However, probably like, yes, if it's like just a little bit of data, yes, you can do it. However, if you want to do anything like with search, like text search, then switch to Elastic. Um, it is like theoretically as like uh, Sandy said, like you can do like geo space, like indexes in database, but technically it's allowed, but I don't know if you want to do it. Same like you can index based on like JSON fields, I think in, Postgres SQL, like technically maybe it will work, but do you want to run on it? I don't know. Yeah, and, and again, it comes down to the index, right? Like if you can do the majority of the, the, the query planners are really, really good. I mean, that's ultimately what they do. A database is an operating system, right? It's an operating system that sits on an operating system. Um, but they, if you can get that query to eliminate you know, 99% of all the all the rows that you need and just get it down to a few that had, they had to do some geo operations on, it'll be absolutely fine. But if you're doing the equivalent, uh, equivalent of, of a table scan across a bunch of geo fields, it's probably gonna suck, right? You've gotta, especially if you're encoding in like GeoJSON or something, if you use um, uh, WKT or some other more compressed uh, binary format, you might get a little bit better response because uh, you're not marshaling as many bytes but uh, you know, having to load and unload JSON every time is just expensive and painful. Yeah. I have one more question if uh, nobody minds. Um, RAM right now is uh, really cheap. Uh, you get 128 gigabytes. Uh, and we, we, we don't operate on the cloud for some of our development databases. Do you have any kind of high level thoughts about how you'd think about indexes if you can fit your whole data set in memory? Like, is there a best practice from don't use them at all to use them only for partial indexes or filtering or? Yeah, no, if you can do it, great. I mean, if you can, if you can, um, the, the, a lot of the problem is from a cold start, right? You need to have a hot index, right? So you can persist the whole thing and load it all, but if you can load all that into memory, absolutely, knock yourself out. It's good, you're, it's gonna be the best you can get. Right? Just, just one comment that, I mean, even if you have everything loaded in memory, uh, if you have an index, it would give you an offset directly onto the jump. Otherwise, it still has to go through the O1 or ON of, uh, if it has to do a full table scan. So your memory would still be good. I mean, you, you, it would still be nice to have this thing. And if you have a lot of RAM, then, I mean, you could just uh, have do RANFS and mount the Mount at least, I mean, you could, Postgres allows you to create table spaces. So you could create a table space where that's essentially sitting in memory for you. So that might actually give you a huge boost in performance. Yeah, that's, that's, that's absolutely. I mean, one, one common pattern you see is people will throw um, like um, Redis in front of it and they'll, they'll use Redis as their cache in front of their database. And it's like, well, what would happen if you just threw more memory at the, at the database and let it do what it does best? Because like I say, it's an operating system. It's, it's a very complex piece of software and uh, it, it's highly efficient for moving stuff in and out of memory. So maybe you'll get better efficiency than, you know, doing it in the application level and, uh, uh, level and, and using Redis.